everybody and welcome to another episode of Creative Visions TV. You guys, I have a great guest today. He's going to be talking to us about something near and dear to my heart, and that is the secret societies, such as the Knights Templar. Now, do we really know who they were? Do we really know much about their history? Do we even know the true history and the facts behind it? What were they hiding? What were they seeking? What were they doing? And were they only in Jerusalem and France? Well, we're going to find out more about that today. So welcome to Creative Visions TV. I'm your host, Karen Dahlman, and we're going to be doing a deep dive into the Knights Templar. But before I bring our guest on, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about him. So he is a leading researcher of Earth Mysteries, ancient civilizations, and sacred sites. He looks at the interplay of these areas within the consciousness of the human psyche. How do these things sync up? What does it do to our own inner makeup and makings? He is a documentary filmmaker. He's probably the foremost leading expert on crop circles, you guys. We love crop circles. And also sacred sites. In fact, he takes people on private tours all over the world to areas that are sacred. And he does a deep dive when he goes there and explores it. And you can also go with him, too, if you want to care to join him. He goes to places like Egypt, Peru, Bolivia, Malta, France, Scotland, um, even the Yucatan. So he goes all over the place. Uh, in fact, I, I'm catching him in between two of his big tours, and we'll ask him about that, what's going on with those. Um, he also is a best-selling author, and he's been seen on shows such as the History Channel, Discovery TV, also Guy MTV, the BBC, and you might have heard him on the airways, especially on Coast to Coast AM. So he's a brilliant speaker, you guys. I, I've heard him speak before. Uh, Contact in the Desert. I've also seen him speak at other kinds of events. And his research is incredible, and his speaking shows it when he speaks internationally at different kinds of conferences. Um, really exciting stuff. So the other interesting thing is that he even does temple-making workshops. Who knew, right? He has six books out in six different languages, originally from Portugal, uh, raised in the U.K., and now living in the U.S.A., so, without further ado, I'd like you to meet our guest today, Freddie Silva. Hey, Freddie, thank you so much for joining us here. Thanks for having me on. I, I'm sounding like I have to live up to all of that now. Well, you do. It's a, it's a tall order, right? You can fill those yeah, shoes. Getting weirder by the minute. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, you just got back from the Yucatan. Is there anything exciting happening down there that we missed? Oh, yeah, of course. A great trip. Um, we actually went to a place, which is a town that no one's ever heard of, mm. and I went up a couple of pyramids that no one's ever heard of, and, uh, and it used to be the place where the gods originally arrived in 9600 BC, uh, and they restarted civilization in Yucatan. Now, we hear about Quetzalcoatl, we hear about Kukulkan, mm. we have not heard much about Itzamna. Uh, these were all three different people who led groups of seven people, seven crafts people and they escaped this sinking land in the middle of the Atlantic after a global flood uh, wiped out their a land called Apple. Uh, we know it by the, another name, Atlantis. Uh, so in the Yucatan it was uh, Itzamna and his group of magician priests that gave us the temple culture we have today. Uh, that's what you missed. Uh, and a wonderful whip of swimming in the cenote as well just to add it uh, a bit of fun. So it was kind of fun going back 11,000 years and kind of showing people, you know, what I've written about uh, firsthand, and it kind of makes it a bit different because you're actually, you know, drinking the history. You're right there with it, and that's what's fun. That's amazing. Um, so if you guys want to go on sacred tours, we'll talk about that later. He does lead these groups down there, and that one looked fantastic. I know these tours sell out quickly, and you guys, I think in about, what, a week and a half, you're going to Egypt now? Oh, is it already? Well, I think it's about a week. Uh, yeah, yeah it's, it's coming up really soon. I saw that, and that one sold out too a long oh, time ago. But I better go. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so look, I, seriously, I'm catching him in between um, his travels. Uh, he's all over the world. That sounds fantastic in the Yucatan. I, I love Chichen Itza and Tulum and 
Uh, I would love to go explore some things that I haven't, most people don't know about. So let's get on to our topic because, you know, people tend to think the Knights Templar were some type of involved in the Crusades and they were protecting Crusaders or maybe they were mercenaries or bloodhounds. Or, there's so many different stories about who they were and that they were only in Jerusalem and in France, but in fact, there's so much more to them. Where does the story start for you? Oh, it starts 50 years before the Templars were created. Mm. I mean, my uh, history teacher, when I was 11 in London, took me a great piece of advice, which is if you want to find the truth about anything, uh, go back 50 or 100 years, find out the roots of things. And I took that advice to heart, and it turns out that uh, you have to look at the people who were behind the Templars, and until you understand people like the Cistercian Order of Monks mm. and the Order of Sion, which has been heavily debunked for a very good reason, uh, and uh, for a very nefarious reason as well, uh, you really want to understand the Templars because the main um, people who are involved in that brotherhood were essentially uh, either Cistercian monks or uh, part of the Order of Sion. You also have to understand the concept of the Holy Bloodline that was perpetrated since about ooh, 3000 BC at the very least, that went all the way through Europe through the Merovingian uh, bloodline. And they are also part of that story uh, because when the Templars you know, these sort of nine, possibly 11 people show up in Jerusalem. They knew exactly what they were looking for. Uh, they kind of went on the back of the Crusades. The Crusades was just a, a fortuitous moment in time. Uh, they have been waiting to do this for a very, very long time. But when they got there, they knew what they were looking for. There was a set plan. Uh, it's almost as if the people had been waiting a thousand years, you know, through different groups, waiting for the right opportune moment. And this presented itself. So... The big uh, story, first of all, was never confuse the Crusaders with the Templars, mm -hmm. not the same people. Uh, that's why it took me 15 years to research this. It was a big minefield. A lot of nonsense had been written about it. Uh, and then once you realize where they lived and who they had contact with and who also arrives in Jerusalem at the same time, uh, one of the first dukes of a little county 2,000 miles to the west called Portugale, which back then was a tiny little principality in the middle of nowhere. Uh, he shows up there at the same time. The future Templar masters there at the same time. All the players that we've come to know are there for two years. And they've all come from the same place in France, uh, the Duchy of Burgundy. And again, you have to understand what the Duchy of Burgundy is. It was like a sort of a renaissance area in Europe at a time when uh, the only thing that was going on in Europe was plunder and death. So mm -hmm. this is like a, a hierarchy of people, uh, some minor nobles who are very rich, who give up all of their money to go and dig tunnels to find <laughs> money in Jerusalem. The story doesn't add up. Uh, and they weren't protecting pilgrims. Uh, that mm -hmm. job was actually handed to the Knights Hospitaller 50 years before. That was their job. And besides, you know, 11 guys can't patrol uh, a terrible right. land between the sea and Jerusalem. That's just... The whole thing is a big smoke screen. So that's where you have to start. You have to look at the things, the stories that doesn't fit, and then ask yourself, what are these people doing there? What was their method? And also, what were they looking for? Because they went there with a very predetermined set of ideas, which they came back to again 12 years later. So this is part of a big patient plan that they were consuming. And uh, if you follow the, the, the connections, you begin to realize that the tentacles are much far wider. And they also did it very quietly. Uh, the whole point of you know starting a new sort of country or a new ideal, a spiritual ideal, uh, under the nose of the church, you have to be very quiet about this. Mm -hmm. And that's what I admired about them, the way they went about this big endeavor without attracting much attention. Well, now, what, what era? We're talking about 1100s, early 1100s? Is that what we're talking about? 1100, absolutely. Oh, okay, so as you mentioned, there's a, there's a lot of secrecy, there's a hiding, there's players coming together. Um, and, and I want everybody to hear this, what we thought about the Templar, they're not these, they're on the wings of the Crusaders, but that's not what they were doing. They weren't just necessarily pr protecting pilgrims going to Jerusalem. There was so much more going on here. And this is where we start getting into the excitement. Now, Freddie's book is, it's called, uh, the first Templar nation. It, it's very detailed. It's, it's, well, you and I were talking about this earlier it kind of gave you a headache because it was, it's a lot of research. I went into this 15 years of research to, to say, I have got to bring this up because as he's starting to talk about all this coming together, a lot of people don't know about this. He's the one that discovered this. So let's talk about these pieces that were coming together, the intent, the focus of this group, 
what were they doing there? Why, why were they all coming together now in Jerusalem? Well, one of the things that, uh, again, goes back 50 years before the Templars was the concept of a group of monks that uh, walked all the way from Sicily, all the way to the center of France to get a piece of land. And it wasn't a very big piece of land. And they said that they were protecting a very old secret back to the time of John the Baptist and Mary Magdalene. Not Jesus. He doesn't even come into the picture. And uh, they called themselves the monks of the Order of Sion. And uh, this order had been going on for a long, long time, before, way before the time of Christianity. And the idea was to protect this secret, uh, which was no one knows about what this thing is. That's why it's a secret. But it turns out <laughs> it's kind of a spiritual ideal that everybody looks for. I mean, it's a kind of a, a state of being which has been practiced from Egypt all the way to Japan as far as 8000 BC. And it, it was all about connecting with a higher power than yourself, a God, a, crea a creator. But not out there, it was in here. It was part of a very ancient ritual to do with a concept called the living resurrection. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to bring this back into mode because they felt that the church, the Catholic church, had usurped power from the true Christian brotherhood, which itself was a continuation of Buddhism, which itself was a continuation of Zen. So mm -hmm. once you got into that path and you understand what Mary Magdalene stands for and what John the Baptist stands for, and why the Templars were protecting these two individuals, and they didn't give a damn about the church. That was just a big smokescreen to get them to survive within the political arena of the day. Once you understand that and the lineage that they were following, now we know what the secret is. Uh, it's more about this, the idea of self-empowerment, and we'll get to that, into that later. Mm -hmm. So you have now a group of people who have been part of a uh, sort of a secret society since the time of John the Baptist, They've been going for a thousand years very patiently waiting for the right moment to end up at specific locations in Jerusalem, which they had thanks to the Crusades. Uh, next, you have the uh, Duke of Portugale, who decides to go off on a crusade to Jerusalem and starts hanging out with uh, the future Templar master, Hugh de Payon and uh, Payen de Montdidier. Uh, there'll be a test on these names later. I was going to say, now, I want to make sure everybody knows how to spell that, too. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and here's the cunning part, because as you said earlier, right, and rightly so, we only think of the Templars in Jerusalem or in France. Mm -hmm. That's it. Right. Well, yeah, we've taken the eye off the ball, because the most important thing about this research, and I had no idea where this was going, was that this Duke of Portugal brings back with him to, uh, to what became the County of Portugal, a few groups of knights from Jerusalem that pledged allegiance to start a new country from scratch. And that's where the whole mystery of the Templars really begins. We've had our eye on one part of the uh, Europe. They're working quite quietly on a nation-building exercise on the other. <laughs> and uh, financing them is the uh, head of the Order of Sion, who happens to be from a Burgundian uh, county, who is himself part of the Order of Sion, and he actually becomes the head of that order in Jerusalem. He's also Portuguese by birth. So he's got a, kind of a dual citizenship going. He becomes the centerpiece between the Portuguese kingdom, the Knights Templar, and of course the Cistercian Brotherhood, who's this, um, I would describe them as a kind of a very ascetic Christian brotherhood that really wanted to bring true Christianity into the forum, not as the church built it, but as the, the idea that Christ and people before Christ had actually intended it to be, an inner understanding of God. So. He was kind of a, the central uh, pin of the whole organization where he holds all these strings together. He has uh, players in all parts of, the, uh, of Europe, and he's able to literally create ties and uh, political ties within uh, the county of Portugal to begin to uh, create this homogenous state within Western Europe as far away from Rome as possible. And Rome wasn't paying any attention. <laughs> so meanwhile, the Knights are going back between Jerusalem and Portugal, or what would become the state of Portugal, and certain places in France as well. And all these players were all connected by certain things. One, they all wore white robes. They, mm -hmm. Two, they uh, gave a part of their salary towards a bigger pot, which could be used then to support very spiritual ideals. They had a secret inner brotherhood, uh, which you had to pay 30 pieces of silver to join. Mm. Uh, very symbolic, by the way, if you know your Christian uh, beliefs. And also, they supported and only cared about one thing, and that was the mummified head of John the Baptist. That's all you need to know about the Templars. Amazing. Because once you understand that, now you're on a very, very different story. 
uh, and they essentially wanted to build a kingdom of conscience. Um, if you look at the letters of Bernard of Clairvaux, who was the head of the Cistercian Order, uh, I've read 500 of his surviving letters. I wanted to get under his skin. Wow. Uh, that's what it takes 15 years to research. Jeez. I want to find out what was going on through his eyes. Once you understand him, you understand the Templars, because he was directing everybody. He was also the center of the organization, and we didn't know that until recently. So that's the foundation of the new story of where the Templars are. Now, when you read those letters, 500, you guys, weren't they written in like an older dialect of Portuguese or something? Weren't, wasn't it you had to take your time to read through that? Oh, worse. It was written in uh, medieval French. Oh, I had to have it translated. Uh, <clears throat> and luckily, someone had translated it, which is very useful. And a lot of them were also in Latin, uh, which I also have to have them translated. But you do get a sense of the... Uh, spirituality of the guy and also his vision and his point was to create a new kingdom of conscience as far away from Rome as was possible because this is the corrupt religion you have to understand they rule the whole of Europe by force and by fear right uh, kind of a bit like politics today this country. oh yeah right <laughs> uh, yeah we've come back full circle and they wanted to start brand new in fact you could say it was the first concept of the uh, United States of Europe in Western uh, uh, in, in the West of Europe and everybody that was persecuted went there and they wanted to start from scratch they had a kingdom that had been marred by fighting for hundreds of years with the Arabs they were slowly driving the Arabs back into North Africa and they were left with this basically desolate landscape but that's what they were good at the Cistercians and the Templars were masters of taking a desolate land and bringing it up mm. into a utopia and Amazing. people loved them for it because they said, you know what, we can support you by teaching your children to go to school. In fact, we'll build the schools for them. Uh, we'll make sure that people are gainfully employed within certain clusters where we'll teach them about animal husbandry and how to grow crops and how to graft plants so you can grow your own fruit trees. And within three years, all of these people living in a desert landscape were running a surplus. They were selling a surplus to cities. And they also had protection from the Templars as well. They had a they had the fighting unit too, which was the exterior of the order. Right. Uh, everybody had to know how to fight in those days. Even the priests had to. And this is why they were loved, and this is why they became so rich very quickly because people handed over whatever little they had to support this great enterprise because everybody was growing together. It literally was a concept of a new utopia. And for many years, and especially around the time when the Pope had to be. Um, a new pope had to be put on the throne in uh, Rome around 1139. Bernard of Clairvaux volunteers one man who is himself a Cistercian monk to become the first Cistercian pope of Rome. Well, ah. the first thing he says is he writes the order that gives the Templar international status free from interference from the church. And that's where the Templars grew very quickly and very suddenly. They had no interference from Rome because Rome, the head of Rome, was one of them. Uh, it's like a big joke. It really is like a big joke. And that's but... hysterical. And sometimes it does matter who you know. You have people really in is. high places that really can help out. So here they are in Portugal creating this uh, Garden of Eden, if you will, a, a, a nice place for people to live together and, like you said, explore, expand, and, and, and grow their own crops, become kind of self-sufficient. But what were they doing? There was some secretive stuff going on. What were they doing over there in Portugal? Uh, and everywhere else, too. There's always an outer brotherhood and an inner brotherhood. So yes. the other brotherhood dealt with uh, mundane stuff, uh, taking care of bills, making sure everybody was getting along, supplies, and, of course, protection uh, from being killed, which is very important back then. And uh, the inner brotherhood behaved like a ministerial college. They, they were practicing things which had been practiced in secret uh, mystery schools going back to 8000 mm -hmm. B.C., uh, all around the world, any indigenous culture will understand this story. And what they were practicing uh, was uh, based on a ritual, a secret ritual, where you would go and spend three years learning about the mysteries of the universe and how nature works, how to manipulate energy, for example. Uh, anything that anyone invested in Native American culture or even Zen will completely understand. Uh, so there was nothing really new. It was just that it was brought back uh, from the dead. It was resuscitated because the church <laughs> had covered the whole thing. Uh, in fact, early Christianity was doing exactly the same thing. So to all intents and purposes, when you look at the Templars, they were behaving and even dressing exactly like the Essenes in Jerusalem and in the Near East. 
And when you look at the origin of the Essenes in the Middle East and what they were practicing, uh, what the Arab people were, were practicing, now it made a lot of sense because the third year uh, involved a very deep initiation into the true mystery of life, how things really are as opposed to how they are seen. And uh, the big clue actually uh, was when the brothers and sisters, because women were allowed in the Templar order, uh, they were uh, de uh, deemed risen from the dead. And that kind of stayed in me. I thought, I've heard this story before. Right. And I had to research the Essenes because they had the same story. They, re re they talked about the living and the dead, but it was a metaphor. And the living referred to initiates who'd gone through a very, um, how shall I say this, um, excruciating ritual that involved an, an induced near-death experience. And it involved taking a poison. So to all intents and purposes, the individual would die. Uh, they would, their heart would beat one beat a minute. Wow. Uh, it was an induced death. Three days later, they'd come back and they'd go, wow, that was interesting. Not like a shamanic dream. These people literally left the body, went traveling in the other world and came back to tell about it. And they came back with some very specific information on how nature really works, how the cosmos works. This is the whole central point of every ancient initiation secret. Amazing. And it's a secret because it can be abused. When you can manipulate energy and can manipulate the ability to do control nature at will, that's kind of dangerous stuff. Yes. So you had to show integrity. That's why there was a secret Templar Brotherhood. You had to be deemed to have integrity. Otherwise, there's no way you're going to go anywhere near the stuff. And that's the big secret that they were holding. One of them, anyway. Yeah, uh, one of them. And so this is why they were basically hunted down by the church, because they were saying, God is here, not out there. <laughs> it's in here. And everyone can have access to this creative force. Well, that's very empowering. You can't have that in a religious political system in Europe at the time. And that's what they were protecting. And you look at the chambers where they did it, you look at the secret wells where they practiced this craft and compare it to other systems of initiation around the world, and it, the story completely lines up. So they're part of a very, very old tradition of self-empowerment. It's amazing. And if you think about it, all these ancient cultures, as Freddie just mentioned, practice something very similar. So you'll hear that story again and again of the death and the resurrection. You'll hear it in Egyptology. You'll hear it in the Dogon tribe. You'll hear it in Native American spirituality. You'll hear it all over the world. And I know that Freddie also takes people to these places, these where the chambers are, where these ceremonial pl uh, events happen, where you would actually take the, the poison, which would induce like a coma-like state, and you would leave, as he mentioned. That's fascinating. So that's one of the secrets they were hiding, um, because this is what the Gnostics were doing. A lot of the earlier traditions were doing as well. Yeah. Christianity said, no, you must go through me, a mediator. You have to go through some middle person to be able to get to God. And, they, and the Pope represented God on earth. And here we were saying, oh, no, 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 no. And it's not the king either. It's not King Philip. It's not the Pope. It's you that can exactly. have domain over yourself. That's, that's, now, that's heretic. That's some crazy stuff back then. Right? Oh, absolutely. And a heresy, the original meaning of a heretic is someone in possession of the facts who is able to choose. That's so if you great. have choice and you have access to information, that's dangerous because we want to control the information. It's that as fake news is already around back then. <laughs> Here you go, you guys, and you guys all out there, you know who you are. You're heretics. See that what exactly. Freddie just said? You Why would choose. <laughs> it's and listen, I'm thing. a heretic and I'm proud of it. <laughs> yeah, and until I understood the uh, the concept of what these groups were doing, and luckily I had. I, I mean, I put this book aside for a few years. Because yeah. I wasn't getting anywhere, something wasn't working, and I wrote a book called The, the Lost Art of Resurrection, mm. where I was looking into this concept, the secret initiation that was practiced even in Native America. I mean, up in the lake, um, in the Great Lakes, around Lake Superior, there was a mm. tribe which I cannot pronounce that even in 1880 was still practicing the living resurrection ritual. Oh, wow. um, and in Guatemala, it's still being done today. I just came back from there. Uh, I didn't do it, but it's still being practiced there. Uh, so until I understood that, I didn't understand what the Templars are doing, because if they were behaving, and to all intents and purposes, they're the resurrection of the Essene, because they behaved exactly the same way, they dress the same way, the mannerisms are the same way. Um, I had to understand what early Christianity really was about mm -hmm. and why the Templars didn't care about Jesus. I mean, they respected them as a, an avatar, but he, they said, well, there's been thousands of them like him. The important people are Mary Magdalene and uh, John the Baptist. That's why we dedicated all our churches to those two people alone. 
uh, which is a very dangerous thing to do back then. And you have to look at the fact that early Christianity, as Jesus was practicing it, and the apostles, was actually what was being done by the Buddhists too. And they were doing exactly the same ritual. So this brings up the concept of resurrection and getting nailed to a cross. When I read the, the banned Gospels by Philip and Thomas, it's quite clear why these things were banned and why, they, why the Templars are so enamored with their work. And that was because they were saying people had taken the resurrection and crucifixion literally and created a false church. They, these are the words of the apostles. Wow. And they said that, no, those who believe in the uh, a physical resurrection and the nailing to a cross are confusing a spiritual truth with an actual event. The two are not the same things. These are metaphors that we're using. That's why the people who are not on the inside don't understand them. And that's how the Catholic Church takes that idea and creates a false religion. That's what they said at the time. And it could have so easily gone the other way. Today, we could have had three billion people on the planet who are practicing Gnostic Christianity and not Catholicism. The two are not the same thing. And that was a big shock to me as well. So, you know, I don't come at this from a personal angle. I go where the information and the evidence leads to. And that's what's interesting about this work. You let the story follow its own path. Uh, so, as I always said, I, I never tell the truth. I tell you the facts. I let I like you figure that. out the truth. I like that. So you set out to do the research, not having any idea where it was taking you. You let it no, let it lead you. And so I think that's I think that's really neat how you did put the book aside and started looking into the initiation rites, this this sacred ceremony you're talking about, because then that kind of put the pieces together for you what they were hiding. But okay, so it, it's it, they're talking. One of the things that that I, I understood from your work is that they're trying to protect or, or I guess protect is that the right word save the bloodline of David. Can you speak to that a little bit more? Yeah, that was a huge aha. Uh -huh. I had found by accident that Harvard has a very rare copy of a book handwritten by the Cistercian monks. And I think the original was around the 14th century. Uh, I don't think there's even a copy in Portugal, which is a bit of a surprise. So someone in Massachusetts must have deeded it to the uh, university. And I begged them to go and take a look at it. And uh, <laughs> like, by some incredible force of intervention, they said, well, actually, this looks like really interesting work. Don't mention it to anybody. We'll let you in for five days. OK, so I'm going to really melt mm. the time. And they brought out this massive book. It was written on uh, animal skin and uh, in pen and ink, beautifully uh, written calligraphy. Mm. There's no index. I don't know what I'm looking for. I'm looking for, <laughs> for the notes of the Cistercian monks, hoping to uncover something unusual. Around about page 600, of course, and this is written in medieval Portuguese, so you've got to read it very slowly. Oh, my gosh. And um, luckily, I still understand Portuguese. And um, I remember shouting a big expletive, which I won't repeat on air, in the middle <laughs> of the Harvard Library. People turned around, and they knew I'd found something extraordinary by the way I, <laughs> I looked at this. Anyway, I apologized, of course, and I said, wow, what is this doing here? And it lists the swearing and ceremony of the Templar master in Portugal. And in the middle of it, it says that he vows to protect the bloodline of David. Now, I figured, mm. wait a minute. If he's swearing to protect the bloodline of David in Portugal, there must be a bloodline of David in Portugal worth protecting. They must be protecting a sacred bloodline, which maybe wondered then that my field had to be expanded. Uh, I was focusing on this. I should have been doing this. Mm. And... Um, how do you prove it? Uh, I wasn't really looking to uh, look at a bloodline, but I had to go there. It turns out the whole point behind uh, jo John, of, John the Baptist and Mary Magdalene was about a divine bloodline, which goes back, uh, according to my new book, The Missing Lands, at least to 11,000 years ago. This is a very, very long tradition, uh, the bloodline of the gods, if you want to call it. And it was protected by two people. One was the priestly messiah who controlled... Actually, it's the wrong term. The wrong term. He um, typified the direction of this society. Uh, they wanted to maintain their bloodline pure because there was something literally in the blood that made these people very special. Huh. They were great seers, healers, futurists, visionaries. And it was by the intermarrying within that bloodline that gave them those special powers. The problem is that over 10,000 years, you're going to have to dilute the bloodline because there's not people of the same bloodline that are surviving. Now, by the time we get to about 3000 BC, you have people called Oano or Oanes, who is the leader of this priestly messiah cult uh, of the divine bloodline in Sumeria. And that word transliterates into John, 
Okay, that's where the word John comes from, uh -huh. from Oanes, which goes back to Uano, who goes back to the lords of Anu, who are the Anu Nagi, Nagi. yes, or the Anunnaki, who are the people of the serpent. It's a badge of office for people all around the world, including the Yucatan, by the way. And there's nothing nefarious about these people. It, they've just been given a kind of a veneer by ancient alien people for all the wrong reasons. It's just they haven't got the research right, unfortunately. But when we take that word and transliterate it towards the Near East, eventually it becomes John in our language. So John the Baptist wasn't his real name. It was like he's part of the tradition of John the Baptizer, who is the central pillar that holds that wisdom. Now, the PR version of that story is Jesus. He's the kingly Messiah. He's like the front uh, that everybody sees because no one wants to pay attention to the guy that has the real power. Mm. That way you deflect the attention somewhere else. Now, the real power, though, comes with the woman, the divine feminine. She carries that blood. And Mary Magdalene, that's not her real name, by the way. That's just the title of office. She goes back to that Sumerian tradition that goes back to the Mesopotamian tradition that goes back all the way to the flood to the time of the gods, and that's the bloodline she's carrying. So that was their big uh, mandate, the Templars. They were literally the next uh, torch bearers along a very long tradition of maintaining the purity of that bloodline. So, cut a long story short, um, John the Baptist is beheaded. Next in line, James is shoved down the stairs. He's killed. Oh dear, Jesus has to take on the mantle of both things. Mary Magdalene is already pregnant. Uh, we know that because of uh, the children, three children that are uh, uh, named in the Gnostic Gospels. And so they faked the resurrection. Uh, Michael Bajant, the late Michael Bajant, wrote about this, if anybody's interested, mm -hmm. and I totally guarantee his work. He was a, a historian theologian, or a theologian historian. Uh, he wrote a good book called The Jesus Papers, nice. uh, which tells how the actual scene evolved and became the story in the Bible. It's a fake death. The whole thing was made up by his uncle Joseph of Arimathea. So it was, a, it was a staged death, a mock death. He goes on to live a happy life in India until the age of 80, dies in Kashmir, and Mary Magdalene, we know, arrives in the south of France, pregnant right. with these children. What happens then? Well, if you have a big bank account, like a bloodline, you're not going to keep it in one box. You're going to dilute that into several accounts. <laughs> one of them goes into France, the other one supposedly goes to Scotland, and the whole concept of Rosslyn, there's another story there, yep. which to the Templars and the Cistercians were very associated, and the other one ends up in Portugal. And I asked mm. this of a, a woman friend of mine who's uh, one of the heads of the um, Eastern Star in America, which is basically the Scottish Rite uh, Freemason, free, uh, the, the feminine Freemason line in America. And I said, can you ask about this with your people? Because I can't prove this. I just know that I'm touching on something that's very dangerous. And she came back from a conclave in Belgium and she said, it was interesting what they said to me. They said that um, your friend has got his nose a little bit too close to the honey pot. Ooh. And I said, that's all I need to know. <laughs> and that was the big secret that they were also hiding in Portugal because the Templars split in about oh, 1156 into two orders. One of them goes more underground than the other ones, and that's what the information is hard to get. So I do believe, uh, I can't prove it yet, but I do believe that there's another bloodline hiding in Portugal somewhere. So that's what they cared about. That was what their big secret was about, because if that came out, it would undermine the entire structure of the church, which gives you the reason yep. why they yep. wanted to get rid of them. There you have it. You just, there's so much here to go through now. <laughs> you just, <laughs> do, whoa. It's a huge oh, story. It, it is, you guys. It's fascinating. And every time I learn more and read more from him, I learn more. You've really got to look at all his books. It all just tie together. Okay, so the, the sacred bloodline is David, the bloodline of David. We're just going to use the word David. Mary Magdalene carried that forward. That came from the, the extraterrestrial gods. Is that what you're saying? They were not quite extraterrestrial. Um, this is the focus of my current book uh, about learning about the gods of yes. the flood. Who were they? Where did they come from? Uh, there is an element of extraterrestrial, but you've got to really understand what do you mean by extraterrestrial and what do you mean by alien. Yes, uh, true. Because they were described around the world as human-like but not quite human. And humans were very comfortable with them, which means they must have been kind of like us. And the um, having traveled around the world collecting information from indigenous people, from New Zealand, Polynesia, Japan, China, uh, Asia, the Middle East, and even the Dogon in Africa, it turns out that they all have one thing in common. They said that these people, 
uh, were here already a long time ago. They, were, they formed a kind of parallel civilization to humans who were still kind of cave dwellers at the time. <laughs> and it was only because of the flood and the sinking of their islands, seven of them, that they were forced onto the mainland. And it was at that point, around 8,500 BC, that humans mysteriously discovered civilization. Mm -hmm. And all the stories said that it was a group of seven craftspeople one woman who was married to the eight, a very charismatic leader, who, they were all very tall, about eight and a half, nine feet tall, elongated skulls, yep. red head with green eyes or blonde with blue eyes. And that's where we get the beginning of the Nordic culture around Scandinavia, because they moved to the Middle East, through Denmark, through Sweden, Norway, end up in Ireland. That's where you get the red hair from. Mm -hmm. uh, you see the statues in um, Easter Island with their little red uh, hats. Yes. They have massive red things on top of the Moai. That was to describe the red hair of the gods. And the one thing that also links them all together is that every indigenous culture says they originally appeared to have come from Orion. Mm. And said it, uh, it wasn't really on spacious. Back then, we had the ability to travel from here to there. And the one story that I found, in fact, the two stories that I found, one in India and one in uh, Native America, said that once in a while, the gods used to take a lucky human being with them to their point of origin which is the bell stars of Orion, and they would send them back to show humans how to live more harmoniously with each other. So Amazing. this is why I mean about the Anunnaki being given a very bad PR. They have. Uh, they were actually, without them today, and the intervening uh, of the flood and also the rebuilding of the earth after the flood, A, we would not have humans left at all. We would have been overrun by these very giant uh, people called the uh, Nephilim, mm -hmm. who were the, called the bastard offspring of the Anunnaki. This is a small group of people who defied orders not to agree with humans and not to interfere with the development of humans, but they get all the attention. These 200 people get all the attention. And it was their offspring that created all the problems. So the, the, these lords of Anu said that they had to manufacture the flood to wipe the earth clean mm -hmm. so that humans would have a chance to rebuild themselves and survive. This is where we suddenly appear out of the blue, uh, having discovered civilization around the world. <laughs> it just happened like that, like we're all right. the same thing around the world. It was because of all these groups of people who stayed behind, the gods, who teach us the accoutrements of civilization, and then, like magic, they disappear. And they said that uh, the, the whole point was about the association with the bell star of Orion. And the culture, the ancient culture, said they retracted the ladder to heaven after that because they said, and this is my projection from what I'm reading, that the whole point of these last 11,000 years, uh, the culmination of which is this moment in time, by the way, according to all the calendars around the world, mm. that we have to learn to be the gods that we've been looking for. Yes. All the time. We keep looking for help. No, the gods said, no, this time you're going to do it yourselves and you're going to realize that you can be exactly like us. Mm. And that big message here. It's a huge spiritual message dressed up within a, a, the sacred bloodline. And that's what's magic about the story. And the Templars were one of many, many dozens of groups who were perpetrating and perpetuating the story, changing their name over time, <clears throat> excuse me, in order so that the, um, uh, the final story can be brought to life. And we're living this right now. This is absolutely crazy. It's just awesome. You guys heard what he said. This is our time right now to step into our own empowerment as the gods we are meant to be. We are divine beings. And so I love that, you know, the Knights Templar knew this. They were protecting that. Going back to this bloodline now, I, I, I got a question to ask you. Do, do you get into any of the RH negative factoring? Uh, do, have you gotten into the RH stuff with, the, with any of the blood stuff? Uh, not yet. It's a bit uh, outside of my that's, sphere of understanding. It's I think very that might important. come up in your new book. Or, or do you think it's going <laughs> to? I have a feeling it's, you're going to have to talk about that a little bit. Um, people are going to want to know, am I part of that secret bloodline? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I mean, take me. I'm not, I'm not going to say that I'm special or anything, but I'm supposed to be Portuguese. I'm supposed to be four foot tall and uh, with black hair. Uh, when I was young, I mean, I'm now six foot five. which makes Yeah, you're a tall very person. He's very tall. I've seen him in person. He's a very tall person. Yeah, and I'm also, I was also blonde and I'm green-eyed. I mean, that does not happen in Portugal. No. And it does make me wonder that some of us, you know, we don't know the true origins of who we are and why we're doing it. And what I'm doing now with my work, I never would have dreamed in my life I would be doing this in my, my late stage of my life. But here I am living this story. And it's beginning to sound very familiar. 
like I said, I'm not saying I'm, a, 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 you know, super special or anything. I just get the sense that there are people on this planet that still have an understanding or a kind of a small remembrance, and we're keeping this story going. Uh, there are other writers who are friends of mine who are following very similar stories because it's a, it's a big subject to cover for one person. And I begin to realize, looking at them, that perhaps we have come back here to finish off the job. Uh, uh -huh. I was just talking to my friend in the Yucatan, uh, Miguel Angel Vergara, who's a superb Maya teacher. We're talking about the gods uh, that arrived on the, in the Yucatan Peninsula 11,000 years ago. And he's pretty much saying the same thing, that you know the people do come back and they carry on this tradition. And most of them are not even aware that they're doing it, but they're followed by an invisible passion. Uh, which seems to drive them through life. And that's what I'm going through in my work and that my colleagues are doing the same thing. So it's almost as though we kind of are finishing off what the Templars didn't finish uh, doing, uh, which is kind of exciting. So, and I do feel kind of guided in my work. Uh, there are things that I cannot explain which have happened by accident or by coincidence. And there's too many coincidences lining up. And I kind of like that. So I kind of go where the, where the, where the story goes. But I, I do agree that the new research into bloodline is very important, and I believe there is one guy, and I'm trying to think of his name. Um, he he was touching on on this. He's, he's an Englishman too. Um, oh my God, Andrew Andrew Collins. Oh um, yeah, I, yes, I, I know who Andrew Collins yeah, is. Sure. I don't always agree with where his work goes, and that's fine. Uh, but he's I think Greg Little, who's his co-writer, he brings up that concept of the uh, RH negative mm -hmm. in uh, one of the books that they published recently. So that's probably where I would go. And I, they probably covered that quite well. But I probably will end up in that situation anyway. I, I feel uh, that but, coming for you in this book you're writing just just came to me. <laughs> Wanted to put that out there, and I was going to ask you if you believe in reincarnation, and that doesn't even matter so much I, because I, actually everything's happening now anyway, in some strange way. That I think what you just kind of answered it, you believe that that you know this, you're becoming the story, you're you're caught up in it. So there's some kind of maybe mission for you, if you will, uh, for for what you're writing, what you're finding for us, and and bringing us back to some of these uh, hidden truths about this group of people that and the bloodline because remember in the da vinci code we the bloodline we were told was the jesus bloodline and yeah. we're hearing now it's a, it's a little different than that it's it's over related i mean the thing to understand is that uh, dan who was my neighbor in new hampshire by the way oh uh, th that's awesome there, would be the only two writers walking the beach looking for inspiration <laughs> and Unfortunately, big paycheck letter on his head, not mine. Uh, he, he, I mean, he borrowed all his stuff from Michael Bajan, from uh, Lee and Lincoln, who wrote yes. the Holy Blood, Holy Grail. So he actually did us a big favor in uh, fictionalizing uh, what was basically a truth, uh, a research paper. And that's why the church spent $13 million debunking the Da Vinci Code. It's a fictional book. Why would you debunk a fictional book? Yeah, exactly. It's a story. There's something there that... Takes the it can be traced back to an original story, uh, and that's uh, why it became so controversial. Um, so there's nothing new about that, uh, but I do believe that there are people who are working within this realm that seem to have an, an inkling of what this old story is all about, and they're bringing that information out. And the more I talk to them, the more I realize that this is not the path I intended to go on in my life. <laughs> so it's as, as though we are being guided to go somewhere, and uh, I don't question that. I kind of just go in that direction because. People are getting a lot of good um, stories and good information out of it, and it make, And I watch people also. You know, this is life because the doorbell rang. Right. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, because you're you're um, extending the the information and making the information available to people and making the story much more readily available to the uh, wider audience, and they are being brought into the story. Uh, and it's t it's literally happening at a time when all the calendars describing mm. the shift to a next world uh, beginning to close in. I mean, the Mayan calendar, nothing was going to happen in 2012. This right. Is a big it was usually marketing nonsense. But if you talk <laughs> to the Maya, they said, uh, yeah, it's, it's a midpoint. The calendar has a 60-year window. So the trick is to reach a certain shift in consciousness within that period. Now, the problem is we're very close to hitting that critical mass. We're not that far, really. Uh, you just don't get to hear about good news in the media. The media doesn't publish good news. Uh, the whole point is to create conflict so you can buy newspapers. That's how it works. Yes. Uh, and uh, they said the problem is that now we have the, we're in the last 20 year segment before the window closes. And if we don't hit the critical mass by then, we're stuck with this paradigm for another 4,000 years or 4,260 years. 
uh, there's a certain mathematical thing around it. And um, they're saying that we are pretty close to hitting a critical mass, but as things get closer to the closing of the window, the more you're going to see in terms around your political um, chaos, chaos mm -hmm. uh, certainly uh, environmental collapse. And the one thing that becomes very obvious in the uh, Veda cycle of India is that this world is going to end by a trial of fire, uh, physically and metaphorically. And you see what's been happening with the fires around the world. Oh. I mean, a huge portion of the world is on fire. Uh, most of the Mediterranean burned last year, Portugal. Uh, everything is scorched down there. It's incredible. Oh, man. Go back there. It's Australia scary. right now? Uh, even New Zealand, uh, parts of Indonesia. I mean, it's everywhere. And you see that something is happening geologically as well as in terms of consciousness. So consciousness and geology and the weather, they all go hand in hand. Yes. If you listen to the indigenous teachings, we're not separate from this. We are creating these changes, but we're also part of the change itself. Mm -hmm. So it's like a big snake eating its own tail. Mm -hmm. Our fraying of the social fabric is a mirror of the change in the consciousness of the planet, but it's also the fact that we are changing and evolving to a new level of order. So there is good news about this. The more, the more chaos you see around you, the greater the potential jump to a greater level of order. And any scientist, any physicist will understand that because that's the order of chaos. It's chaos and there's order. There's more chaos, there's going to be a potential jump to more order. So it's, it's, it's a very good place to be right now, and we are part of that change. Yeah, there's chaos theory, and chaos theory says what you just said. If you go further enough out in the chaos, you're going to see order. And that's really what's happening. We were, we're getting to that point of finding that for ourselves. Now, you brought up a great point about the, the change. And we're going back to the Templars where they were doing these initiation ceremonies where they resurrect and die and resurrect kind of thing. What? So we're not going to probably, I'm not telling everybody to go out and take poison, okay? We're definitely not doing that. <laughs> so what, you mentioned something. You said we can start raising our own consciousness, becoming more aware of that. What do you recommend that people do? in order to do that without having to do, go into these older, you know, ceremonies. Very expensive scotch. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and uh, good massage. Uh, that well, might I'm, knock you out uh, for a while. <laughs> <laughs> the, the thing that the Templars did, it's still uh, today replicated within Scottish Rite Freemasonry, but they do it symbolically yes. where the third degree, the initiate is raised from a figurative grave by the master. The blindfold is removed because now that the person has new information, they can see, okay? Mm -hmm. And they're declared risen. So it's still performed metaphorically. Uh, if you go to Guatemala, they're still doing the ceremony and they drink a concoction called balche, which uh, yeah. after seven days of fermentation, it becomes a poison. Uh, we drink the one day fermentation, just to give you an idea of what it's like, kind of a sweet honey thing. Okay. Kind of makes you a little giggly, but that's about it. Um, today, it's very hard to find it unless you go into deep jungle areas of Polynesia or know someone within Native American tribes or somewhere really out of the way because, of course, the lawyers will jump all over this. Oh, yeah, Take right. Take poison and induce an enough experience. I don't think so. So you can be very careful. And also, oh. if you put that out there and your heart is true, I'm sure this, the right people will come into your consciousness that will actually facilitate mm. you to have that experience. But you will have to take at least six months of your life away from the modern world to do it properly. That's what any good shaman will tell you. Mm -hmm. You can't just be a weekend ayahuasca no, practitioner. No, no. Next big change. Uh, ayahuasca is a kind of simulation, okay? Uh, to do this thing properly, you really have to go through a, a near-death experience and you actually leave the body. The visions are not like in an ayahuasca retreat, which are a result of a chemical interaction with your brain. The, the experience is actually you having left the body in another level of reality and coming back into your physical self. That's very different. So these retreats are actually an approximation. Okay, we're not dealing with shamanism. We're dealing with something very, very different. So today, the one thing that I've come that still is practiced that gives you a, a certain degree of comparison is Kriya Yoga. Uh, and I'm reliably informed that in India, the true practitioners... And they'll say the same thing. Give up at least a year of your life to do it properly, mate. Don't come here as a weekend yoga practitioner because, you know, like most Westerners, you're going to be disappointed. It's just going to get an inkling of what it's about. But Kriya, apparently, is the complete uh, manipulation of the uh, your internal energy grid, your electromagnetic field, which we're all hardwired with. 
and be able to consciously manipulate that grid to create that experience of leaving the body. And they said, yeah, under the right circumstances and teachings, you can do it, but you need to give up a lot of your time in order to do it properly. And then you can leave as long as you want. Uh, there was people in uh, Egypt, in Cairo, back in the 20s, that could leave the body for four months and actually declare the date when they're going to come back. And there was one guy that had himself buried alive with a little straw, okay? You've got to have some okay. going into the grave. The grave was uh, guarded 24 hours a day for four months, and exactly on the hour and the minute, they dug him up, and he just went, I'm hungry. Um, <laughs> because it's about the complete manipulation of control of your own temple. That's what it was about. Mm. Hence the Knights Templar. There was a metaphor behind that name, too. It's about controlling your own inner temple. When you can do that, you don't need exterior things. You are God. You are an image of that godliness. And that's what they were practicing. So in a certain manner of speaking, the Templars were also practicing yoga. Ah, interesting. Yeah. Um, so they were, okay, when, when they were in Portugal, I understand they were digging a lot of tunnels and stuff. Uh, what was that all about? Was that, was that going to secret chambers to do this work? Is that what that was? Such yeah. as this you're talking about? Uh, in Portugal and other places around Europe, that's exactly what they were doing. The tunnels were sort of to mimic or to send the initiate uh, in a kind of a, a mimicking of what the soul would experience when ah. you're in complete darkness. You don't know what you're bumping into because that's what your soul does when you leave the body. You're bumping into the fourth dimension and you don't know where the hell you are. The idea is to control your fear. If you leave the body with fear, you're not going to make it back into your living body. Uh, you literally will die. People do this in the Great Pyramid every year. Someone pays 12 grand to go and spend the night in the king's chamber. And most of the people do not come back because leaving is easy. Uh, I can tell you that because I've done it uh, in the king's chamber too. And oh. coming back is the hard part. You have to know what the hell you're doing. And this is why it takes three years of understanding and training to know the right spells and incantations to know your way back to your physical world. So the tunnels were kind of getting you prepared for what you're going to be experiencing. So it comes as no surprise. And also, they always led, and it was always on the right-hand side, uh, not the left-hand tunnel. It was always the tunnels on the right, which mimics your intuitive brain, not your mm -hmm. left. I'm right. thinking through this. That ends up in the secret uh, initiation chamber. And there was one particular article in the secret rule of the Templars that said, never reveal the hiding places of the inner brotherhood. And those who do reveal the inner teachings and the mechanics uh, of the resurrection and the inner chamber, uh, they'll be put to death. And they were serious about this. Even if it was the king of France, they'll, they'll shoot the king of France. Uh, actually, back then, they would just take the bow and arrow and poof. Right. Um, yeah, because the, it, when you have access to that kind of knowledge, and you can work in two worlds at the same time. That's dangerous stuff. If it's not Very happening. dangerous. But you begin to manipulate people. That's not what this was about. This is about self-control, showing that you are a pillar of the community, and then resonating that energy around you so that others can see, hey, that person's got it right spiritually. I want to be like that. And that's how the world evolves. Slow movement, okay? No preaching. You just show by example. Mm. Uh, kind of like uh, Gandhi said. As I was well. going to say, that's what Gandhi, Gandhi says, said. Buddha says. All these yeah. great leaders show by, lead by example. They always say that. So the Knights Templar knew this and were doing that. That's, that's amazing. Absolutely. So there was nothing really new that they were practicing. They just brought it back into vogue. Uh, for a, a hundred years or so. And that's why they were uh, loved by the people who uh, they were teaching this to, and they were hated by the people who weren't getting into the uh, inner brotherhood. And that makes a lot of sense. Oh, man. So to recap, you said that, they, the, the, let's recap what the Knights Templar were hiding in secrecy. Would you recap what that was? Yeah, they were basically protecting two things. One was the uh, ritual of how to leave the body and return mm -hmm. to be declared risen. Uh, which any Egyptian would understand because that's what they were doing in their tombs where no one's buried. That's why there's no one buried in the tombs. Right. The bodies are buried elsewhere. Uh, and uh, it was a, a matter of uh, taking the spiritual ideal where someone could experience the other world, come back with specific information, and live their life completely aware and awake in complete control of your manifestation process to create a kind of a utopia on Earth at a mm. time when Earth was not a good place to be, uh, at least Europe anyway. And the second was to protect the bloodline mm. of the people who had carried this information for at least as far as I could be able to track it down, 11,000 years. So it's part of a continuum of how spirituality develops in the face of chaos, of darkness, 
on the earth and how we maintain that 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 balance and that edge throughout the inconsistencies that we come to call the the physical world. Uh, and we don't we need it more than ever right now because things are at that black and white stage politically, uh, not just in America but also in Europe and around the yeah. world. And they're hanging on for their life. You know that their time is up. It's like the dinosaurs watching a, a series of rocks right. through binoculars and saying, we're going to basically have a big party because we're not going to make it. And that's what's going on right now with the dark. They know that the time is up. And in fact, if there wasn't this much chaos going on right now in the world, I would be concerned that people like me were not doing their job properly. Bringing this mirror out and this information out so that others can show, hey, there's a way out of this. We can actually have control of the situation. If things were quiet, I wouldn't be doing my job properly. That's, ah, that's the way I see it. Very interesting way to say that. So the, the Holy Grail now is basically protecting the bloodline, which was Mary, Mary Magdalene, right? Is that what the Holy Grail was? The Grail was many things. The Grail was a person, uh, a receptacle, uh, a divine bloodline. It's the same thing. Okay, uh, yes. The person is the receptacle of the blood itself. It's a, it's a sang real. That's a royal blood. Grail, yeah. But the grail is also a, re a receptacle of knowledge. Uh, they call it the treasure, the Templar treasure. Mm. You have to understand the real meaning, the original meaning of the word treasure. It's thesauro. It's where we get the word thesaurus from. And what is a thesaurus if it's not a treasure of words? Ah, nice. That's the treasure that the Templars really were searching for under the Temple Mount when they're digging tunnels. Remember, rich people give up their money to go to Jerusalem, uh, 1,500 miles away, to dig tunnels in really horrible conditions. Yeah. Now, why didn't they just stay at home and keep their money because they went to Jerusalem to look for money? It doesn't make any sense. Uh, yeah, the Essenes did bury silver and gold under there to protect it from the Romans. That's not what they were after. They already had money. They didn't need all that money. Um, what they were after was a treasure of words, and it was the words, the scrolls that the Essenes hid, which had been copied and copied and copied for thousands of years. Mm. And they said, no, this, this is the real treasure. We're going to hide it here. The Order of Sion will be the protectors of the understanding of where the stuff is. And when the right time is right, when the Romans have gone and the Catholics have gone and everybody else has gone and the Syrians have gone, sometime when the right time comes, the right people will be brought back here to uncover it. Because when the Templars found the scrolls, the first thing they did, they hid it in a cloak inside one of the main guys. He takes a journey off to Europe to what is today Belgium, hands them to a cryptographer. Now, why would you need a cryptographer to understand scrolls because everything was written in code. That's what it means. Ah, and nice. that's when suddenly all the Templars vanish from Jerusalem and suddenly Portugal is created by the Templars. They begin to uh, appear hodgepodge throughout France. They go to, to um, England. They, they build preceptories in England yep. and they create the first preceptory just outside Roslyn in Scotland. And suddenly you have this trinity of control, a spiritual control around Europe and a, and a renaissance. It's a beautiful story. But it's also but, a trinity, yeah. if you take the lines from where things are located, right, it becomes actually an equilateral little triangle, doesn't it? Where Rosalind uh, is and then where uh, Portugal is over to the sacred in Jerusalem, where it isn't that, isn't like a triangle there or something? Yeah, it's an isosceles triangle. Uh, oh, isosceles. The same. Uh, yeah. uh, it's incredible. Uh, if you take the exact location that the Templars specified as their yeah. place of residence, which means that the king of Jerusalem had to agreed to leave the building because that's where he lived. They said, no, we need this place specifically. Now, nine guys are not going to threaten the king of Jerusalem because the king of Jerusalem has got a whole army to fight nine guys. And he said, okay, you can have the place where I live right now. He just remodeled it, for heaven's sake. That's amazing. Yeah, you put the next pin exactly on their uh, main hotspot in Portugal, in Tomara, which, by the way, is named after one of the daughters of Mary Magdalene. Amazing. And you put the third pin in Roslyn. And it forms a perfect isosceles triangle. And you bisect that by the golden ratio. You eventually end up in this volcanic dome in the middle of Switzerland, on top of which is the origin of the house of Sion. You can't make this up. It's mathematically correct. Uh, and you keep projecting that line. You, go, you eventually end up centuries later in Newfoundland, in St. John's, which is named for John the Baptist. After that, we get the creation of America by the Scottish Rite Mason. So you see how the story oh, yeah. is moving ever westwards. And here's the big story that most people don't know, uh, especially in these days of Islamophobia here in America. Uh, it's very rewarding to know that the Scottish Rite Freemasons, who are the Knights Templar under a different name, mm. they just changed their name when they moved to Scotland. That's all they did. It was a PR exercise. 
when they learned the mysteries teachings from the Arabs when they were in the Middle East, they said, well, the idea of the initiate is to follow the star in the West, a symbolic star. That's what the initiate always had to follow, always towards the West. And the star was called Medica. That's why the country we live in today mm -hmm. is called America, not mm -hmm. after America Vespucci. That's just a, a stupid idea created by a uh, German priest who fancied himself as a historian. And he was taken as fact. So the country was named uh, for America, the Arabic star of the initiate. Now, that's not going to go down well in the Midwest, I don't think. But that is the truth. That is crazy. I've never heard this before. Is this in your new book? Uh, yes, it is. So it you guys, there's so much more. I by accident. I thought that makes a lot of sense because the, the crumbs crazy. line up beautifully. And again, I'm not approaching this from a point of view of my ideal or my understanding uh, or the fact I'm trying to prove something. I'm following a trail of evidence. I just go where the trail goes. That's where the trail ends up. That's fantastic. I've got to ask this question, too. You know that show on TV called Oak Island? They, they're looking for the Templars' oh. treasure, buried stuff. Now, did the, the Templars make it up to there, to Nova Scotia and Canada? Well, we don't know. It's a big secret. That's what secret's all about. Uh, we know that they're in Nova Scotia. We know that they're in Labrador, because Labrador is yeah. the Portuguese for, um, well, a person who works the earth. Uh, it was a kind of a metaphor for, for a person who digs below the surface. Oh which is what ancient mysticism is all about. Um, yeah, of course, they eventually went down the coast because there are just here outside of Portland, Maine, where I live, we have a couple of islands where there are Templar symbols. Yes. Still carved on rocks, which yes. appear now at low tide. That's the problem with Oak Island. They will never find anything. One, those two idiots, they are idiots. They've blown up the evidence. They have. I know, they just keep digging and ruining it. They entire site with dynamite, for heaven's sake. And the problem is no one's actually figured this out which is so obvious, in the eight centuries that the story has developed, the sea level around this part of the world has risen several feet. That's why the thing is flooding. They'll mm -hmm. never get in there. Mm -hmm. And there was one program that saw, and I don't really watch it because I, I watched the first few episodes and I was just shrinking in my chair that anyone could put this and be so dumb. I have to say, it, it's really dumb. Uh, and um, it's just making lots of money for the History Channel. Right. And uh, a friend of mine who's an editor said, you want to look at this particular episode? I said, why? You want to look at this? I said, oh, right. So I managed to get the library to get me a copy of one of the episodes. And it looked at uh, these boulders, the, the white boulders. I thought, that's funny. Those white boulders look like they're very strategically placed. And when I looked at these from above, they formed the constellation of the swan, which in that period, around the 14th oh. and 16th century, that was the symbol of the divine bloodline and the people who were protecting it. Interesting. It's the divine woman. And Whoa. in one of the Templar places in Portugal, there is a woman who represents Isis or Mary Magdalene holding the swan. I thought, wait a minute. Mm. If I was an initiate in the 16th century, walking down <coughs> uh, the coast of, of uh, Canada towards America or Medica, I would have pointed to a strategic location, a back door, because it was too obvious. There's a well. You're gonna, people are going to go in it and dig it. There would have been a back door. Oh. If you follow the neck of the swan, I bet you there's a trap door somewhere in that bay because it wasn't a bay back then because the sea level's risen. Three episodes later, an independent investigator said, yeah, you want to look at this because it's the uh, constellation of the swan. <laughs> and guess what they found? They found the trap door, which, of course, now is tidal, and they can't, they're can't. they always working against the tide. So that was the one piece of evidence that I thought was very interesting about that. Interesting. Them. You missed That's your spot the on the show. They should have had you on there to talk about the swan. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's just money, fantastic. But... Listen, I, we could talk all day about this. Isn't this exciting, you guys? I knew you would just enjoy having him as our guest here. So where can people find you? Tell us a bit more about you guys. All the links will be below. But, but Freddie, please tell us where they can find you. Uh, I have a big website called invisibletemple.com, which tells you all you need to know yeah. about what's in there. And yet, I have books that range from crop circles, which are essentially the brand new temples that we have today, uh, all the way through the Art of Resurrection, through the, the Templar book, and of course the books on the origin of sacred space and the uh, origin of the gods and temples. So there are DVDs there, there's 11 documentaries. Uh, you're going to be there for a few months, so just like an initiate, Take some time off your busy life. <laughs> find out what's really juicy and is happening right now. And you're going to be at Contact in the Desert this year. You weren't there last year. You were there the year before, I believe. That's when I saw you. But So what are you talking about at Contact in the Desert this year? Do you know yet? 
Yeah, I, uh, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, he's got some time. I it's not till no the end idea. of May. You got time. Um, it'll be a surprise. It'll be a secret. Yeah, um, there you I'm go. talking about the mechanics of sacred space, how sacred mm. space actually works uh, and what it does to you and for you. Uh, and there is a method to this spiritual technology. And I'm going to back that up with a precy of my new book, The Missing Lands, about the origins of the gods of the flood, mm. where they lived, and also the revelation of one of the missing lands where they once lived. Uh, we don't know where the Anunnaki lived. We have an idea that it may have been around uh, Armenia. That's one possible okay. thing. But I have found through a wisdom keeper, the last wisdom keeper of an island you'll never hear it from in uh, Polynesia, that the Anunnaki were also in the middle of the Pacific in 3000 BC. And they've been going there before that. And he says, and they lived on an island which is now under the ocean. And I will reveal the location or where Ooh, that location. It's you... not Lemuria. It's not Atlantis. We have been so blinded with the story of these two islands that we've forgotten about the other five. Is and it that, Mew, by chance? I can't tell you. Oh, I gosh, I think you. I'm close. I, I have to think, you on screen. I think I'm close, you guys. Listen, you got to go out. If you're, so if you're going to contact in the desert this year, that's in Indian Wells, California, down by the Palm Desert area, Palm Springs. That'll be a great time to hear his new work. So this is so exciting. Well, Freddie, I want to thank you again for coming on. It's been a great honor having you here, and you shared so much, and... Gosh, I just want to hear more. Don't you guys too? <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. thank you. So there you have it, you guys. Look at what Freddie's out there doing. He's just allowing this mission to pull him through life. It's like when you get really excited about what you're doing, passionate, and you follow those passions, it does become your mission. And then all kinds of things line up, synchronistic things happen, and next thing you know, you're probably uncovering the secrets to the world, to the universe. So get out there and explore the God that's within you, because after all, all truth sits here within yourself. Go seek and you shall find. And until next time, this is Creative Visions TV, and I'm Karen Dahlman. I'll see you again real soon. Bye-bye.